Welcome to True Crime and Wine. I am Sherilyn Dale and I am so glad you found me. I had every intention of wanting to have some wine today for like the first time in so long and we spent the whole day out in the sun yesterday and I woke up with a terrible terrible headache got no sleep last night either pretty sure just like was like way too much sun so we're gonna just drink water today and do the smart thing uh so maybe next time that is on my mind though I haven't drank wine in so long and I think because I've also gained weight people think I'm pregnant but um I'm not <laughs> I just am eating lots and enjoying it so yeah I have a riddle so the riddle is once you are given one you either have two or none? What is the answer? All right, um, right, let's get right into it today, okay? This case is one that I came across the other day, and when I tell you that like my jaw hit the floor, I gasped. I was like, what? When I found out the verdict in this case, like I'm not lying. I couldn't stop thinking about it, so I started looking more into it, and as I started watching the actual trial, also, some of the interrogation footage, I like somewhat was able to understand a little bit about um, why the decision was made at the end of this trial, but um, I still can't stop thinking about it. It still doesn't make it easier, and I really want to talk about it, so I want to talk about it with you. Today, we are talking about the unimaginable death of Lori Waterman that happened in Craig, Alaska. This happened in 2004, and Craig is described as like a very tiny, idyllic town. It's close to Ketchikan in Alaska. I'm not very familiar with a lot of places in Alaska, but Ketchikan and like Juneau are the ones that I, I think about. So I knew nothing about Craig, but the way that it's described is described very beautifully. One of those places that's so small and off the beaten path that you actually have to travel by like boat or small plane to get other places and one of its biggest appeals is that it's very tight-knit so everybody knows everybody there's an extremely low crime rate basically any crime that does happen is a DWI which is not cool or like a bar fight also not cool but you know like assaults and murders and stuff like that don't happen and it's really not threatening enough of a town that people want to like lock their doors or vehicles or anything like that. So when a woman named Lori Waterman went missing on Sunday, November 14th, 2004, it left the community on edge, but I think everybody was just really hopeful that there was going to be some innocent explanation and she was going to be found safe and sound eventually. It was later on Sunday evening that Lori's husband, a man who went by the name of Doc, reported his wife missing. Right away when they called the police, they knew who the Watermans were. They were very prominent members of the community. Doc and Lori had met each other when they were living in Utah and he was a decorated serviceman. When they got together, they moved their life to Alaska. He became the local like go-to realtor, very active across the whole community. He was also president of the school board. And Lori is also described as very active in all aspects of the community, um, very into her church, volunteer work. She was described as somebody who is always helpful, um, eager to help. Like if you needed a hand with something and you didn't want to deal with somebody kind of being like, oh, like I, I, have, I don't have the time. I have a million excuses. Like Lori was just like always happy to be called and thought of. For work, Lori was a special education teacher's aide, which can be quite challenging. But for Lori, everybody who knew her said that she had a lot of pride in her work and just really loved being around children and definitely had the patience for, for a, a job like that. They were parents themselves. They had a son named Jeff and a daughter named Rochelle. And growing up there, family and kids are kind of described as what you would hope for. Smart, very close to family, accomplished in lots of extracurricular activities. Rochelle was in uh, academic decathlon, volleyball, choir. I think part of also keeping busy, especially in the teen years for the kids, which may be key in an area like Craig, I think it sounds ideal for 
you know, adults, as we get older, that's kind of like what we're looking for, right? Like a like le- less is more, not like the hustle and bustle. And for kids, it would be really boring, right? Like, oh, we're just trapped here in the middle of nowhere. So you kind of got to keep yourself busy. And one of the things that Rachel used to do, or Rochelle, sorry, it's like I'm having like a Vanderpump moment right here, you guys. I, I want to be done with the <laughs> Vanderpump references, you guys, but they just keep coming. Anyways, Rochelle had a blog that she would use to take up some of her time. And she did write about how isolating it could feel in Craig. She actually referred to it as hell. You know, everything is like worst case scenario when you're 15 years old. And you can kind of pick that up very instantly when you will go to her blog. And the title of it is called My Crappy Life. But the perks of being involved in lots of activities and stuff like that is that you get to go away for like away games and away like on a plane usually to another area of Alaska. And on the weekend of November 13th, um, Rochelle had one of these away games. She had a volleyball tournament in Anchorage and Doc also happened to have a board meeting in Juneau that same weekend. So both of them were out of the house at this time. And Lori uh, happened to be completely alone because their son was on the mainland at college. So it should have been like a nice, you know, little weekend for Lori. Had the house to herself. Rochelle is off having fun getting away from Craig that she feels so constricting and isolating. And Doc was doing what he, he loves doing, being involved in the community, at a board meeting, running the show. So when... The weekend wraps up and Doc and Rochelle come back home. At first, they don't think anything is out of sorts, but as they're kind of unpacking and and walking through the house, they realize, where's Lori? Where's mom? They look on the driveway and see that her van isn't there. At first, they just think, okay, maybe she's gone out visiting a friend, but they start to look around the house and a couple things just like don't look right. First thing was that the bed wasn't made and that was very unlike Lori. She always made the bed when she woke up and especially if she was leaving the house. And on the kitchen counter, there was a wine bottle that was left out. Not an alarm bell in my home, but in the Waterman home, it was a big alarm bell because Lori didn't drink at all. I believe Doc did occasionally, so that's why there would be wine in the house or it was used for cooking, but to have it like sitting out on the counter as if somebody had just like drank a bunch of it, 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 it just didn't, it, it didn't sit right. Those two things were alarming enough and out of character enough for Lori that after trying to call her friends and see if anybody had heard from her and when they found out no one had, Doc and Rochelle started driving around the entire town looking for her. Unfortunately, they don't, they don't find her, Lori. They don't find any sign of her van, and so they make the decision to call the police. Investigators come to the home. They get a quick brief of the situation that Doc and Rochelle and their other son would, was away from the house. And Doc also shares that on Saturday evening, Lori did have a kind of like a gala, an evening for a, uh, the Chamber of Commerce. They were doing this dinner event that she was attending. And so the initial thought was, okay, maybe something happened after she had left there. But friends who were with Lori that evening showed photos of what she was wearing that night and those clothes were in the bedroom. So she had obviously made it home from that event and sometime after coming home, she went missing. Taking a deeper look around the house, a couple more strange things popped up. There was like a tip of almost like a rubber glove found on the carpet. There was also fibers that looked like it came from some like synthetic rope and a footprint on the windowsill. As investigators are gathering information at the Waterman's house, Alaskan uh, state troopers receive a call that a hunter had found a burning van with potential human remains in it. And it is found in this like logging road, which is essentially just kind of out in the middle of nowhere. When those officers arrive on scene, they come across a van and it's still smoldering. It's not still on fire, but there's still like smoke coming off of it. But they could tell that the fire had been so intense because it had uh, melted the license plate. 
Now, despite there being so much damage, there were human remains that were covered. They were able to make out a skull in the back seat of the van. It initially kind of looked like a really, really bad accident. Again, you kind of have to bring yourself into the the area of Craig where it is very low crime, something horrific like this, like there's a reasonable explanation. Maybe this person went off the side of the road and there was like an explosion with the vehicle. But as investigators started investigating the scene, a few things did not sit right, mainly that the remains that they had found were in the back seat of this van. And so they couldn't find any signs that a driver had been driving this van. And then further looking at the van, it didn't look like there was this catastrophic car crash. It looks like it was just set on fire and completely, you know, intact structurally aside from obviously the fact that it had burned, but there was no like crumpling of metal or anything like that. Once police get this information, they contact Doc and they let him know that they obviously still need official confirmation about who the skull belongs to and whose van this is, but it's just, it's not looking promising. Even though the van was just completely obliterated, the VIN was still intact. So they were able to get the VIN and then run it and see if it belonged to Lori. So that was the first starting point. This was all happening on Monday. And Monday morning, Rochelle had gone to school. Since everything was so tight-knit, teachers and some of her friends were asking how she was holding up. And everybody deals with things in different ways and Rochelle just kind of seemed to be like I'm fine there was no official confirmation and she was kind of with the sense of if it is my mom and this is her van you know she probably got drunk and crashed her van later on that afternoon the VIN comes back saying that it in fact belongs to Lori so this is Lori's van at the very least we know So uh, Rochelle's godfather is asked to go and pick her up from school. He's also their neighbor, the Waterman's neighbors. They're a very close-knit family. So he goes to the school to pick up Rochelle to bring her home so that the police can deliver the news while she's with her father. He says when he walks into the school while she's waiting for him at the office, he says, all right, we have to go. And she says, I can't. I just called Jason. Now, Jason is somebody that uh, her godparents knew about. He's somebody that the Watermans were familiar with as he was hanging out with Rochelle lately, and it was quite a big point of contention in the house. This wasn't a relationship or a friendship that the Watermans wanted for Rochelle, so the name was familiar to him, and as he's getting ready to say, like, doesn't matter, let's go. Jason comes into the office and he's hugging Rochelle and he's saying, it's going to be okay. You you, you know, I'm here. You just need comfort. He looks at her godfather and says, she just needs to be comforted right now. Like I've got this. And her godfather's like, yeah, that's why I'm here. That's why I'm bringing her home to her father and we got to go. So she did end up leaving with her godfather but when they arrived at home and Rochelle went in Jason shows up at Rochelle and Doc's house as the detectives are arriving and he says I need to be a part of what's ever going on there like she needs consoling and she needs me they're just kind of like same thing as the godfather like what we've got this from here it's all good and they basically just leave him outside inside they officially notify Doc and Rochelle saying that the van came back and that it it was Lori's but the there were partial remains in there and those still had not been confirmed yet they were still waiting for an autopsy report to come back now Doc was a veteran that served in the Vietnam War so he is somebody who takes news like very stoically his friends say and that is how it's described as him taking that news I guess a lot of people would look at it maybe as like unemotional but his friend said behind the scenes he just was always preparing for the worst and learn how to compartmentalize grief the way that he did in war because he thought like if I just try to deal with all of this right now like I don't 
think that I can go on. It's kind of like if he had all of this high hope um, and then you're constantly getting awful news right after each other. And this is like really hard stuff to deal with. I, I can understand, I guess, that train of thought. Like, okay, we need to compartmentalize. We don't know everything yet. We're, we're going to prepare for the worst though. And if it isn't, then at least that's a, a different emotion that we can deal with at that time. But unfortunately, in this case, um, Doc was right. The dental records came back. Uh, from the skull that was found in the back of the van and it was confirmed to be his wife, Lori Waterman. Everybody in the community, when they found out that this was Lori, I guess, you know, reacted like how you would expect to react. Like it, it turned the whole town upside down. This was just not even like on a scope of any, anybody's reality, something like this happening in their town, let alone to somebody that was like as popular and loved and involved in the community as Lori was. Now, initially, investigators first turned to Doc as a suspect. I guess there had been some rumors that possibly he had like a wandering eye. I feel like that comes up often in these types of situations. And despite having an airtight alibi. I mean, he was away in Juneau at the time. There was this initial belief that maybe he had hired somebody and that they were aware that he was going to be gone, Rochelle was going to be gone, and that Lori was going to be alone. They poured through his financial records, his cell phone records. They talked with extensive family and friends. And after trying to put a case together, they just decided there was absolutely no evidence at all remotely connecting him to any sort of plot and that Doc and Lori truly had a very loving marriage. Since investigations always start very close to home and usually work from the spouse on and then work their way out, the next was Rochelle to look at. And the lead detective on this case knew the Watermans personally. He knew that Rochelle had changed quite a bit in that past year in terms of her appearance. She was dressing a little bit more darker. We've talked about this in other episodes, though. Clothing does not make a criminal, but her behavior had also tra changed a lot. And he was aware that the Watermans were having some issues with her very upset, particularly that she was spending time with older guys. They first looked at her blog because she was very open on it. The majority of the entries that she wrote in her blog were pretty much like the typical woe is me teenager gripes. But I guess if you're looking back into a situation that is now like the mother of this author is now gone and some of these posts are quite angsty, it doesn't look too good. Um, on April 6, 2004, she wrote, I had a bad night. I had a bad day. This is my warning to all of you. If you piss me off, you die. And those who knew Rochelle made it very well known that she was not getting along particularly with her mother. She was definitely pushing the limits of rebellion and it wasn't necessarily directed to Doc. It was usually Lori and Rochelle that were at odds. So investigators bring Rochelle in for questioning. Uh, how's she with you in terms of, uh, how's your relationship? Pretty good. I mean, we have our normal teenage mother daughter stuff. She doesn't like my black finger on polish and that kind of thing. But we have a good relationship. We talk actually a lot compared to what I know about my friends and their mothers. Okay. So she, she's already confided in a lot. She, yeah, I do confide in her. Does she confide in you with things? Once I was on the verge, she came to me with baseball bat on my legs. So they're kind of putting feelers, feelers out there, seeing what the vibe and tone is at the house. They ask her if there are issues with her mom um, and that they have been kind of like hearing some rumors on the street that they haven't been getting along very well. And Rochelle says, yeah, she hit me. So they're like, oh, oh, okay. Would you like to elaborate a little bit on that? And Rochelle says that there had been several occasions. She said one time her mom came into her room and hit her with a baseball bat in the legs. 
Another time she tried to push Rochelle down the stairs, she said, and then there was once one time that she said Lori tried to come at her with a knife. So these are very serious allegations of abuse. When they're working through figuring out, okay, like what is the, the, the point of this disagreement? Why is everything going so sideways in the house? They find out that the majority of the Arguments start because of Rachel spending time with these older guys. She admits that she's drinking, smoking weed, and at only 15 years old, when you're hanging out with 24-year-olds, it's not what Lori wanted for her daughter. They find out that these two 20-something-year-old men who are hanging out with 15-year-old Rochelle are Jason Arant and Brian Riddell. Jason is the one who showed up at the school and then showed up at Rochelle's house after the fact when or uh, Lori's van was identified. And he and Brian were very close friends. They had been close since their teen years when they met at a youth group. They were so close that they actually became blood brothers. And in their minds, the, you know, making that blood brother oath uh, entailed that whatever either of them needed, no matter what it was, no matter what time, they were there for each other. Jason was a military dropout who was working as a janitor at a high school. And Brian had opened up a computer store that he was trying to get off the ground. People who knew them though said that they were kind of like, burnouts. They spent most of their time playing video games all night. For Brian, he wasn't really putting like too much into the business. It was more of like the cool place to hang out and play Dungeons and Dragons and stuff. And they would just get high either at the shop or in Jason's mom's basement. And it was the summer before Rochelle's junior year that she met Brian through a friend and they would play Dungeons and Dragons at his computer shop. He got pretty close with Rochelle. Brian said that she definitely had uh, a wild side and liked to party. He said that the more they hung out, the closer that they got. But the age gap for him was just like something that really freaked him out. So he ended things with her. But they still continued to hang out and be friends. And that is how she eventually met Brian's good friend, Jason. And the two of them started dating. At first, they kept their relationship on, on the down low. They were just mostly communicating through computer or they would write out letters to each other and then get other friends to exchange it. But her family did soon find out that this is who she was hanging out with and that Jason and her were getting closer and like more romantically involved, which was a big concern for the family when they found out that he's like 25 years old. And it seemed the more it bothered Lori, the more Rochelle would push back and spend more time with him, which is something he apparently enjoyed a lot despite her being only 15 years old. He considered her like out of his league. He was very protective of this relationship. And so when investigators find out more about this relationship, they ask her to elaborate and at first, she denies ever being romantically involved with either of them. There's been any sexual contact between me and Jason and your wife? No. Not at all. No. Well, so, well, if we could tell you we've had some information from the That's completely false. Mm -hmm. So, why would Jason and Brian tell us they have sex? Trying to make their egos in place. When the detectives are like, well, we're kind of hearing that like this Jason guy is like fully head over heels in love with you and that this isn't some in innocent friendship, Rochelle does crack a, a little bit and says, okay, they had been physical and that Jason was someone who was very protective over her and that Brian was a friend who had a bit of a temper. So they're like, okay, like... <laughs> What, is, what does that mean, a bit of a temper? And Rochelle says basically that he would do a lot for somebody without even really knowing them. So if you were very close to him, then there was just no telling what Brian would do for you. So they're wondering, okay, if you're also sharing that you've had issues with your mom and that your mom is abusing you like you're saying, potentially the these two could have taken it upon themselves to stick up for you, right? And she says, no, like absolutely not. I don't, I don't think that it would have ever gotten to that point. 
and they ask her if she's willing to wear a wire. They say to Rochelle, you know, if if they're going to confess to something and that they have done something that maybe you don't even know about, this is for the greater good of the community. There's clearly a murderer out there. People are on edge. And the person that this murderer murdered is your mother. So like, why wouldn't you want to protect the community and at the same time solve your mother's murder? And her response really left a a bad taste in their mouth. She said that she needed some time to think about it. And she thought that it was kind of like cagey. It didn't seem right. It was very dishonest. So they pump up the heat with Jason Arant. They they just give it to him straight. Like this is our assumption. You had something to do with this woman's death. And he says, absolutely not. He insists the entire weekend that Lori was killed. He was hanging out with Brian. They were together the whole night, but they weren't out committing some murder. They were watching The Princess Bride over and over. When they talked to Brian, he did say that, yes, they were together, they watched movies, but that he had slept at his own house, and that story didn't really line up. It said that they were together, but they weren't really, like, doing the same thing, and Jason had said that Brian had spent the night there. Even though it doesn't really match up, it's not really complete evidence enough to hold somebody and charge them with a murder. Now the next day, instead of calling in a suspect and asking them to come in, which is usually how it goes, if you have a suspect, they're not usually ones to pick up a phone and just call you often and check in. Not that this is what happened, but anyways, the next day after that interview, uh, the police department gets a call. It's Jason And he said he had just been attacked by a man in a parking lot that was wearing this black hood. And all he said to him was to stay away from Rachel. Rochelle. Gosh, Sherilyn. He's called in to elaborate a little bit more at the station. And he says that there was no witnesses. It was just him by himself. But he had this scratch on his throat to prove that there had been an attack. And as investigators are looking at it and asking more questions, it just doesn't really add up. And it looks like it was like a self-inflicted scratch. Usually there's ways of like telling that by like the, the pattern of the drag. And so they just up and confront and say like, we don't believe that you're telling us the truth and that you're staging some attack. Why are you doing that? And that he's trying to deflect involvement in what happened to Lori Waterman. And they kind of map things out. They give him a little bit of leeway per se. They say that they don't think that he acted alone, although they do think that he's involved and that they believe that Brian was heavily involved in whatever happened. And it would look much more favorable to him, however this was all going to play out, if he cooperated and if he wore a wire to get a confession from Brian. And Jason agreed. He didn't just agree to wear a wire. Before leaving, he agrees that they've got it pretty much all right that Brian had uh, murdered Lori. He was aware of it, and he said that the reason this was done was because Rochelle told them that she was being physically abused by her mother. Basically, all Jason would acknowledge in terms of his involvement is that he knew it was going to happen and that he was just the driver. So he says that he is agreeing to wear the wire so that he can get proof that he was not the killer. Jason arranges to meet up with Brian and you can tell that Brian is a little bit nervous. He said that he sensed that Jason was talking different than normal but is just trying to push any doubt away because like he had a lot of confidence in this friendship. Obviously, you know, like they're they're blood blood brothers. You don't turn on a blood bro. So they end up going for a drive and they're just talking about what the police were saying to each of them when they took them in for questioning that first day. And then the conversation shifted more to Jason pretty much just laying everything out there, pretty much a full-blown confession of the plan that he knew that it was going to happen, that he was the driver. But, you know, just like having it clarified that Brian was the one that did everything. And just based on how the conversation was going, Brian asked if he could drive him to his parents so that he could say goodbye. He goes home. He says to his mom, mom, you know that murder 
which, you know, like maybe in a busy city would be, you wouldn't know which murder because there'd be so many, especially our city right now is horrible. But in, in Craig, of course, you knew it's like the only one. And his mom was like, yes. And he said, the cops think that I did it. And it was basically like, this is goodbye. And he was right. He was called in to go to the police station. They confirm that, yes, Jason was wearing a wire like he suspected, but just didn't want to go there and, con- you know, and confront him about. And at that point, Brian just had nothing to hide. He fully admitted to killing Lori. Everything just kept leading back to Lori being abusive and Rochelle needing to be saved, which Brian explained was a large trigger for him because he came from a very abusive upbringing and he thought, okay, like if I'm a boy who grew up like that and felt like very unprotected and vulnerable and unable to make the situation better, I can't even imagine how she feels of being like a 15-year-old girl who's going through this and felt like it was his duty to protect her like he wished somebody would have done for him. Can you describe what it was like as you were being raised? Very religious, um, lots of discipline. What uh, kind of discipline? Physical. Like, uh, describe that for me, please. Um, switches. Uh, Wait, what do you mean by switches? Like berry bushes, okay. uh, cedar branches, whatever, so thin, whippy pieces of wood. Uh, one by fours, one by twos, uh, broom handles, uh, rubber hoses, uh, hands, not too many fists, mainly an open hand, if that ever happened, but that was rare. Basically, my parents believe in the verses that say, spare the rods and rods spoil a child, that uh, you didn't stick children in corners, you didn't do things like that, that was just not the way to go. How did that make you react when Jason was telling you that Rochelle was being beaten by her mother. I have a major problem with people who abuse their children. Um, It's just something that I don't like. And I was imagining what it was like for me. I thought about what it'd be like in her situation. I felt her situation was worse than mine because of the things that she'd related to me and then things Jason had been telling me. Uh, And I felt if it was that bad for me, how much worse can it be for her? As I told Jason, I felt someone's life had to be in jeopardy and there had to be no other options. Uh, And that's what I originally told him. With Brian confessing to the murder, he also confessed to everything that happened. And it's just like up your spine chilling. We'll get into the details in in a minute here, but I think what's also really chilling is that this was not the first plan that was made either. This had been something that was discussed for a really long time. And there was one plan, the plan that was just not long before the one that actually carried through, where Brian went to the school that Lori worked at and waited for her to walk to her car in the parking lot. And he had a rifle and he was going to shoot her as she was getting in the car. And he said when he got to the school, he realized that he forgot like the bolt in his rifle or something like that. Again, not a gun enthusiast. We There's always somebody in the comments and it's like, that's not like what it is. Oh, this is does not associate with it. I'm like, I don't I don't know guns, okay? But anyways, something was there that was going to prevent the rifle from working properly, and so he called it off. And his version is that once that failed attempt happened, he thought that everything was like pretty much done at that point. He was even seeing less and less of Rochelle and Jason hanging out, but he said that he's just still being fed information from Jason that like her life is in danger and something has to happen and she's still writing in her blog not really giving any indication that that information isn't true that's coming from Jason in May she wrote something along the lines of like current music listening to and she said it was the pounding in her head and then the entry to that post was I hate violent people so this I mean like literally 
you know, leads somebody to believe that what this person is saying is true and they need help. And that's when they came up with the other plan, the one that actually ended up going through. There was a lot of thought into this. Brian even organized things to throw police off of an investigation like wearing different shoes, different size shoes, sorry, collecting dirt and sand from different areas of the city just to like mess up the area of the crime scene. He brought brand new clothing that was freshly washed, scrubbed his skin raw to make sure that there was no like skin cells that could be left behind easily, shaved his entire body hair so that there was no like hair follicles or DNA that could be left. And he said that evening, the commerce event that Lori was at finished around 9.30 p.m. Jason dropped Brian off close to the waterman's house and then headed off to an area that was isolated that they had pre-planned that Brian was going to meet him out there with Lori in her vehicle. Brian did not have a key. There was no door that was left unlocked for him. And at first he said that was, he was panicking a little bit because he couldn't get into the house, but there was a cat door and he had, you know, long slim arms. So he was able to put his arm through the cat door, unlock the door and get in. He said when he gained entry, he's slowly walking through the house, trying to be as quiet as possible. But Lori must have heard something because all of a sudden he sees her bedroom light go on. He just stands still. He's kind of in shock, like was not expecting to kind of be caught before he's even gained full entry or come up with a plan of like what he's going to do next when he gets into the bedroom. So he's just standing there in the hallway and kind of going over like it all right well this is done and waiting to hear sirens there's no movement from Lori's room though and there's no like hello is anybody there so it's just like dead silence and waiting and him being like did she hear something maybe she just turned the light on because she's reading And am I going to follow through with this? And he ends up standing there for like about an hour and a half in the hallway, which just creeps me out. And he finally goes into the bedroom not knowing what to expect. And Lori was sleeping when he went in. He says he caught her completely off guard and came up from behind her, shoved his knee in the back of her back so that she couldn't move. And he said she started crying. To calm her down, he says, if you cooperate, I'm not going to hurt you. And so terrified, but desperate, obviously, Lori does as she's told. He then put a gag on her so that she couldn't scream and brought her down the stairs and asked her to point where her purse and car keys were, which she did. He then said that in the kitchen, he saw that there was a bottle of wine that had about two thirds of the wine still in it already. And he decided let's get her drunk to drink it. And this is going to make this plan a lot easier and make it seem like it was a drunk driving accident. So Lori drinks it. And because she is not a drinker at all, two thirds of this wine bottle completely intoxicate her. At this point, Brian puts her in the back of her own van and drives her to the furthest end of the island where Jason is waiting for them. Just trying to imagine that and put myself in Lori's position, like it just gives you this feeling in the pit of your stomach, like the hair just raises all over my body because I cannot imagine this woman's terror being woken up in your house having somebody, you know, force you to drink alcohol, you're gagged, you're put in your own vehicle, driven away, you get to this dark, isolated area, there's somebody else waiting for you. And the poor thing, like when they get to the meeting spot, she's so drunk that Jason and Brian need to help her get out of the van. And Brian says like right there, like when they get her out, he tries to make it look like she got in an accident and broke her neck and that's how she passed. He says that he's basically trying to like twist her her head off and it's not working. So he karate, karate chops her throat. It's not working. And poor Lori is still alive during this. And all she says is, 
can I ask you a question? Brian says what? But since she's like so delirious and intoxicated, she just keeps asking that question. Can I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question? And the only response that she gets back is eventually from Jason who says, you will not ever hurt Rochelle again. After trying all of these ways to break her neck, Brian's exerting himself too much. He's like, okay, well, this obviously is looks more like an accident happened here anyways. So we're not going to be able to follow through with this drunk driving accident with this broken neck incident. So he just puts his hand over her mouth and nose and suffocates her. At this point, they're like, okay, well, now every like all of this evidence needs to be destroyed. They burn the vehicle with Lori's body in it and all of the clothes that they're wearing. With Brian's full confession, he is charged and arrested on November 18th, 2004 with Lori's murder. At that point, Jason had not been arrested yet because his involvement, he had really distanced himself as much as he could in terms of saying like, I was just the driver. And then when he was brought in with like the full scope of the story and everything that Brian had said with all of this premeditation, he knows he's also going to jail. But one of the main things that investigators wanted was they wanted to know if Rochelle was the one behind all of this, who was, I guess, spearheading this mastermind of her mother's murder. And initially, when they asked Jason what her involvement is, keep in mind, Jason, these, Jason has spoken to investigators several times. And He's always kind of putting the blame on just Brian and the reasoning why is just because they were trying to do the right thing. He says that that Rochelle had nothing to do with this. This was them being the heroes behind closed doors. But after a few other times of being interviewed, he says that the only reason that they did it was because Rochelle asked. And without her involvement, they would have never known that Lori was going to be home alone this weekend, that weekend, and wouldn't have been able to carry out the plan. Pretty much simultaneously, Rochelle is also brought in for further questioning now that they have somebody in custody who has this full confession. She's informed of her rights. She agrees to speak with uh, detectives without her father or an attorney. And even though in prior interviews where she's really said, you know, I don't think that they would do anything, not even wanting to wear a wire, now when they're like, okay, this is what we've got out here. Now we know pretty much everything that happened. Our job today is to find out if there is evidence that you told them to do this. He said he might use Brian. I wasn't sure, for sure, if not. But I mean... You didn't approach him and say, I want you to kill my mother. Not exactly directly. I just said, I, sometimes I just wish my mother wasn't here. She causes me so much pain. Okay. And he said, would you have, would you rather her dead? And I said, I don't know. And it just kind of jumped around the bush. But the, the gist of it was, yes, you did want her dead and you wanted him to take care of her for you. Yes. Okay. So, from there, what happened? Different ideas were discussed, and I didn't really have a lot to do with it. it was I'm sorry, ideas were discussed? Different ideas that Jason had. And you know, like scenarios for carrying yes. this out. Okay. At this point, she says that, okay, yes, there was a conversation about them wanting to help me get out of the situation that I was in at home, but I never wanted them to murder my mother. I said, don't do anything. I don't, we've been getting along and I just don't do anything. I don't want anything to happen. But you knew what was planned, scheduled to happen. I, I, I knew they were thinking about it. I didn't know if it was for sure. And then, he, like I said, he said, you're just being over emotional, you're freaking out. And I said, no, 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 and we just kind of got in this fight and it just ended up going, boom, boom, and we, I hung up on him. So, what did the conversation leave you with? It leave me with me saying, no, don't do it. And 
Maybe it was just like that teenage angst stage or what, but Rochelle's attitude in the interview surely didn't help her any. I, would, I wouldn't say quite combative, but a bit combative and had that just like, I don't know, that, that angsty teenage comeback attitude. Like when the interviewer said to her, okay, well, you must have not protested too hard about this plan because obviously she's not alive anymore. She sarcastically bites back with, well, maybe I shouldn't ever be on the debate team then. The interviewer calls her out on it and says like, you do not need to be a smart aleck. And she says, and you don't need to question everything I do. I mean, <laughs> that's kind of their job, Rochelle. For a really long time in this interview though, she keeps insisting that they offered, they kept offering to kill Lori and that she would turn it down. This goes on for a while until Rochelle pretty much admits that the story that she was portraying about her life at home, especially to Brian and Jason, was pretty much all lies. Her mother and her didn't get along all of the time, but the abuse was not to the extent that it was, and that there had been several conversations of her saying that her life would probably be better if her mother wasn't in it. And in the interrogation tape, she just says, like, my whole family is going to hate me. She and Jason were both arrested on the same day. It was November 19th, 2004. And she was charged the same as Jason, like pretty much full involvement, conspiracy to commit murdery, m murdery, conspiracy to commit murder. Can't make it sound cute, like murdery. No. Kidnapping, burglary, and first degree murder. In June of 2005, Brian Riddell ends up pleading guilty and he receives a 99 year prison sentence for his role in actually murdering Lori. Jason also confesses and avoids going to trial, but since he didn't actually like commit the murder and Brian had admitted that he had, he only received 55 years for his involvement. Rochelle pleaded not guilty and she ended up going to trial in January 2006. Both Jason and Brian, along with a few of her friends, testified against her at her trial. And it wasn't just Brian and Jason that were talking about these abuse claims. Several of her friends, some of her other ex-boyfriends also said that they heard similar stories of abuse. They also said that Rochelle told them that Lori felt that she was fat and would withhold food from her. But every one of those friends besides Jason and Brian said that it was kind of like in one ear, out the other, and that it never felt like she was being honest. They said that the story would kind of always grow. It would start out with like something like her getting grounded for doing something. And those groundings were like having her computer taken away or some or no TV. But then the next time you heard the story, it was like snowballed and snowballed and snowballed. And pretty much all of them knew Lori and just couldn't see like Mrs. Waterman being this essentially like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Mr. Hyde, Dr. Jekyll? Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. Again, though, like people are different sometimes between closed doors, but they did have Lori's best friend, who's Rochelle's godmother and neighbor, and also Doc testify. And they both said that they had never seen Lori be an abusive parent and that every, every emotion that was coming from her was like out of concern, being a parent that was just trying to do the best for their child. In fact, Doc even testified that the only time that he can remember Rochelle getting like a swat on the butt was by him when she was younger. I don't recall any physical discipline. I, I, I may have paddled her when she was quite young. I don't think that's very effective as they age. Why is that talking about 2003, 2000? No. Now, um, when your wife, Lori, the discipliner, in that period of 2003, 2004, how would, how would she discipline um, The minor discipline... Sometimes she'd tell me, and, and someday it was the same thing. Sometimes it was a restriction or uh, something of that nature. That would, that would be the typical punishment for either one of us. But I didn't, we, did, we didn't always discuss minor discipline. Okay. What about major discipline? 
major discipline, she would come to me and ask me to be the enforcer. Okay. That's when you put the restrictions on. I'm sorry? That was when you put the restrictions on her? That would be, that's correct. Okay. Um, did you ever see her during that period of time, 2003, 2004, did you ever see her physically uh, hit or strike Rochelle? No. Did Rochelle ever say anything to you during that time, 2003, 2004, hit her or threatened her? No. Jason testified that the only reason why he went off of Rochelle's word was that he had seen bruises mostly on like her wrist or arm area and her legs, which Rochelle's dad ended up testifying about saying, yeah, she usually was actually covered in bruises. And that's because she participated in a lot of sports. Uh, sports like softball and volleyball. And in those areas, like you (laughs) definitely are known to have quite a few bruises. I remember when my daughter was in volleyball, like all up of her arms, there could be bruises, her legs by going to try to get the ball and not let it touch the ground, but she wipes out to, you know, save the team. It's just so sad because when Lori's best friend particularly was talking about her and her character and what she was confiding in her about that was going on at home, it was just that of like a really concerned mother not knowing what to do and just feeling like so helpless. Her biggest worry was for her daughter that she was just going to get trapped in this relationship, whether it be you know, young pregnancy or getting trapped in a marriage at a young age and with his lack of stability and lack of of motivation, like it would prevent Rochelle from being able to see the full potential of of her life and what, you know, Lori knew that she was really capable of. You said that from what you could see, Rochelle, Rochelle's relationship with her mother was was typical of a teenage daughter with her mother. What do you mean by that? They had their little squabbles, um, and they had their good moments, too. Um, They shared things like going to honor honor choir and Lori chaperoned, and she, she was very proud of her daughter. And then there were times where she wish that Rochelle wouldn't act the way she did or date the boy she did. And um, I know they had little squabbles over it and uh, major discussions. Lori was very concerned about um, Rochelle's recent behavior. Now, in Jason's testimony, he really pushed a lot of of this planning and the pressure coming from Rochelle. He said that on multiple occasions, he suggested of ways of her to get out of the house. Everything from let's just run off together to trying to get her emancipated from her family. And he said no matter what he suggested, she would find ways that it wouldn't work. That's kind of when Brian came on and he said that at first he just thought it was almost kind of like a scheming dark fantasy of like how much better her life could be if her mother wasn't in it and didn't really think that it would ever get to the point of like it seriously going through. He also said that he was trying to come up with suggestions to get her out of the house too. He said, you know, why don't we get her to set up a bunch of security cameras throughout the house that are going to capture this abuse so that if she does go to social services or the police, she actually has tangible evidence that shows like this is what happening, what's happening and I'm not just, you know, being an angsty teen trying to get out of my house because I keep getting grounded from my computer. He also said that there was just always a reason why it wouldn't work and that Jason was constantly putting more and more pressure on him to like get the job done. It eventually got to the point where Jason was essentially saying like if something happens to Rochelle, this is all on your shoulders because you could have have helped her. Like you know all of this is going on. And Brian's like I don't know that this is going on. And Jason said that he had recently been on webcam with Rochelle and saw himself, Lori, come into the bedroom and hit her with a baseball bat. And Brian said like his biggest regret was actually not talking to Rochelle directly or even Lori. 
yes, they were friends at one point and quite close, but he said that after um, Jason and Rochelle started getting more serious, hanging out together, Jason would kind of put like a wedge in between Brian and Rochelle. He would say things like, oh, yeah, Rochelle is like just a little bit scared of you. She doesn't really know if she can trust you or consider you a friend anymore. He was kind of always like, don't worry, like we'll be friends again. She's just like a little bit apprehensive right now. So everything was kind of going through him as like the middleman. Rochelle's friends also said that Jason had threatened a few of them, especially Rachel's male friends, to stay away from her. And that's really upsetting because I do think that if, yeah, if Brian had spoken to Rochelle or had the nerve to speak to Lori, I think that he would have felt the same way that I do in that I don't believe that there was any abuse whatsoever. There had been a letter that was found in the house when the police were doing their investigation. And it was a letter that was written from Lori to Rochelle. And in it, it breaks your heart. She just basically says like, I'm very aware that things are tense in the house right now. She knows that she worries too much and should have, you know, like a little bit more leniency, but that's what moms do when they just love their children as much as she loves Rochelle. She writes like that she hopes she knows how much she loves her and how desperately she wants their bond to get stronger and that no matter what, she's always going to be there for her. Now, this is kind of where I have like gone back and forth with whether Rochelle knew that it was going to take place this weekend or not or had been involved in other plans. We do know that there were several other plans that were talked about and that she was aware of conversations that were being had. There was an email between Rochelle and Jason where they talk about a hunting trip and he says that him and Brian are going to go on this hunting trip, but they called it off and they're going to do it at a different time because Brian wasn't ready. Jason ended up testifying about this email saying that was that one time that he had gone to the school and was going to do this like in the parking lot. And he even writes several times throughout emails that all of this planning is really stressing him out, but he knows that it's going to be worth it for them. And there was a lot of plan. There was there was a one plan where they were going to plant a bomb in Lori's car. They were going to cut her brakes. They were even going to take her out into the middle of the ocean and attach concrete to her feet. Now, where I waver on whether Rachel knew it was happening specifically that weekend or not is after those other two close attempts, Rachel allegedly told Jason that she didn't want to go through the plan. And she felt like things had been getting better with her and her mom lately. And she just kind of wanted to see how that panned out. Brian was was able to say that he was aware of that during his testimony. And he said it was a couple months after that that she got grounded again. And with this grounding, she wasn't able to go on her computer and stuff. Therefore, she wasn't able to communicate regularly with Jason. And when she does talk to him again, she says that she thought that it would be best if they just kind of pause their relationship until she's 18 years old and wait and see how things go. Brian said Jason told him this and he said that Jason was really upset about it. Brian said that his biggest fear was if she waits until she's 18, then she's probably not going to want to be with me anymore. The next he hears, he, he, hears from Jason and he's all worried and he says he fears for Rochelle's life. He thinks that either Lori's going to kill her, she's going to kill Lori, or she's going to kill herself. And no matter what happens there, he's responsible. At that point, it's when he says there's an opportunity this weekend when Rochelle and Doc are not here. And I guess that's kind of like one of the biggest things that stands out to me is them knowing about Rochelle and Doc not being there that weekend. In the same sense, I guess even if you are still trying to like distance yourself a little bit from somebody, it could be like, yeah, I'm not even here this weekend. So like, don't even bother calling and then a plan hatching without you knowing. Then I go back to the day after her mom was reported missing when she actually went to school before the VIN came back being associated to to Lori's van. And when everyone's kind of asking her how she's holding up and she says, you know, I think, I don't know like what's going on, but it was probably like a drunk driving accident somewhere. Why would you say that if it, that wasn't the plan that was already mapped out, especially when like the biggest indicator that something was wrong was that there was like an empty wine bottle in the house because your mother didn't drink. So why would she be drinking and driving, you know? And I also feel like if there were conversations in the past, people say horrible shit out of anger 
And there's definitely a, a part of your brain that is just not fully developed or functioning in your teens. And you just kind of like spout out whatever the hell you want and don't even think of a consequence. So I don't think that that is out of reality of happening, but it's just like what you do do with that after the fact if you really felt this pressure from people like okay well like we need to save you and you saying like no 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 please don't please don't do anything and not calling for help or telling for help I'm telling you right now like if anybody is watching this that is younger or in this situation or have done something that you've regretted and you need to put a halt to it like just be honest it's gonna be way better in the long run of course like your parent would understand if you were like yeah I really hated you that day I was like well, I wish that you weren't around horrible horrible to hear but at least like let's let's get some protection going on and have like it all laid out there that there was a plan and there's people that were going to carry it out and put that to a halt and then for Rochelle's defense they argued that it was actually the detectives that were like the biggest bullies to Rochelle. They were the ones that wanted to push the narrative that she was this mass manipulator in everything and that it wasn't Jason. He's not the one who like got jealous and didn't want to lose her. And they pointed out that they felt like her confession was a lot of pressure after severe like intimidation tactics. And a lot of that they felt like they proved by just going to town on Jason being like, you denied Rochelle's involvement up until that last interview when you know jail time is on the table, not just for involvement in murder, but for also being like a creep dating this underage girl. None of those charges showed up because you you took a deal. You wanted a shorter sentence. Look at Brian. He's got 99 years. You've got half of that. And they feel like it's because they really wanted him to focus on Rochelle, implicate her. And then part of the deal was to testify against her and make it look like she was just this like 15 year old, like mastermind. It happens though. At the end of this trial though, there was a hung jury. There was a retrial held in 2011. And at that trial, she was only convicted of criminal, criminally negligent homicide and sentenced to only three years in prison. Three years. She was released in 2016. Today, she goes by the name Rocky. She lives in Florida and she still writes on her blog. So now you know why I've kind of been all over the place and why I needed to talk about this and where I don't know what the F to think. I have a riddle. And I think I just like remembered that because it kind of has to go with like this, this case. Once you are given one, you either have two or none. Okay. And the answer is a choice. Once you are given a choice, you either have two, either choice or not take it or none. <laughs> and that's what's going on here. There's always, there is always ways of backing out of bad decisions and you have the choice to carry through with a really bad decision or not or just stay home and get fried like he should have done because that's what he was doing with his little dungeons and dragon parties anyway and I didn't mean that to sound condescending because I really want to learn how to play dungeons and dragons <laughs> okay guys I just I really need support here I need to know what you think and um yeah that's it for me today if you haven't already please don't forget to like and subscribe Love and appreciate you. I do. I, I really do. I don't know why I'm quirky. It's the sun, you guys. I, got, I swear I got sun poisoning yesterday. Okay, I gotta go. I'll see you in the next video. I will miss you terribly. Until then, make sure to love each other, love yourself, and I will see you soon.